Hi, I'd like to talk about this recent project. It's on archive and everything here is joint with uh, Mikhail Filanov. I'll just get right into it. I'll start by saying a couple words about <coughs> Havana homology. Uh, so here's the setup. Let L in three space be an oriented link with some diagram D. So Havana defines a chain complex of graded abelian groups. So there's homological as well as an internal grading. And the main theorem is the following. The chain homotopy class of this complex is an invariant of the link and its graded order characteristic is the Jones polynomial. And I won't say too much about the complex. Uh, I want to highlight one aspect of it. Uh, well, first off, it's built combinatorially from the link diagram. The ingredient in defining the chain complex is so-called two-dimensional TQFT, here I'll denote it by F. And what this means is the following, uh, F is a rule, uh, it's an assignment, and it gives you a module F of C for a collection of circles, C in the plane, say in the plane. And it gives you a map between these modules for uh, cobordisms between circles. So it turns the topological information into something algebraic and moreover, this assignment is functorial with respect to composition of cobordism. So um, you can think of this as a functor from cobordism category into a module category. And in particular, if you apply the, so that's what the TQFT is roughly speaking. And if you apply it just to a single circle, it has this extra algebraic structure. It's what's called a Frobenius algebra. Moreover, there's the correspondence between these two-dimensional TQFTs and Frobenius algebras, so kind of use them interchangeably. Now, in Hawana homology, there's, I'll highlight two really relevant Frobenius algebras or equivalently TQFTs. Uh, probably the most familiar one is this ZX mod X squared. And so the ground ring is just integer, so you just view this as an abelian group. And this is cohomology of CP1. And then there's this bigger Frobenius algebra. So it's Z adjoint E1, E2, and X mod this quadratic relation. And this is the U2 equivariant cohomology of CP1. And the ground ring here is just Z adjoint E1 and E2. And when you define the homonym chain complex using this Frobenius algebra, uh, you get what's called equivariant or universal homonym homology. And equivariant or universal versions of like other link homology theories have also been developed. And here's a, a short list of this. So McKay and Vaz did this for the SL3 homology. They did a universal version of this. And Krasner did this for SLN, Kwan Rosansky homology. And then Wu did this for the colored versions. And really relevant to what I'll be discussing is uh, this final thing on the slide, the recent constructions of SLN homology using uh, this Robert and Wagner closed foam evaluation are naturally equivariant. There's naturally these extra parameters like E1 and E2 above built into the theory when you use uh, Robert and Wagner closed foam evaluation. And, and this is kind of the perspective that we'll be taking. So that's equivariant link homology. Let me now talk about uh, a little bit about the annular link homology theories. So Asayada, Pristitsky, and Sikora define homology for links in interval bundles over surfaces. So as a special case, we can take the thickened annulus. So this is annulus cross an interval. So it's a trivial bundle. And the theory you get is known as annular Havana homology or annular APS homology. Um, and the, the annulus, for the annulus, there's a nice description, which I'll, I'll give now. So I'll also let this boldface A denote the annulus. And I always think about this standardly in some standard way embedded in, uh, in the plane. So if you have the link in the thickened annulus, you just project it onto, say, annulus cross zero slice, and you obtain a link diagram. And then you proceed as in the usual way. You form the chain complex which I won't discuss, but you form the chain complex in the usual manner and you draw everything in the annulus and you remember that uh, the link diagram lives in the annulus. And here's an interpretation of the annular complex. The winding 
number more or less induces a filtration, the differential respects this filtration, and then the annular chain complex, you take the associated graded. Uh, so annular homology in particular is triply graded. There's homological gradings, uh, the usual quantum or internal grading, and then you have this uh, new annular or winding number grading. And everything I said is for non-equivariant story, but an equivariant version of this was defined in, um, in an earlier paper of mine from last year uh, using this filtration. What we did with, with Mike, we define equivariant SL2 and also SL3 annular homology, but we use this Robert-Wagner idea of these closed foam evaluations. And that's what I'll be talking about. Um, and in particular, in the SL2 case, we, we recover uh, the, the homology in this earlier paper. So let me start discussing our setup. So here's the perspective we take is identify the interior of the annulus with the punctured plane, which I'll denote by the script P. So you have the punctured plane is kind of replacing the annulus and links like annular links correspond also just to links in this thickened punctured plane. So there's really no difference. And we'll take the punctured plane perspective. I'll let L, I use this notation later, let L denote this line in R3, say just the z-axis, and we'll call it the anchor line. And we're going to define a suitable TQFT, and we're going to use universal construction, which I'll explain on the next slide. And let me just sketch here what we're going to get. So we're going to get a module over some ground ring, which I'll say later. We're going to get modules, I'll denote this by bracket C, for any collection of like circles uh, in the puncture. And we're also going to get maps between these modules assigned to generic cobordisms, S, which live in R2 cross the interval from C0 to C1. What do I mean by generic? So the cobordism S could intersect this line L, but only in its interior. The boundary of S lives in, the, lives in these punctured planes, the top and bottom of R2 cross the interval. The interior of S is, can intersect the line and it has to do so transversely. You'll note that in the annular link homology, if you're familiar with it, these cobordisms, the cobordisms that appear there are always disjoint from L, but we, from this line, because they happen kind of away at the crossings, which are away from the puncture, but we are kind of, when we get this additional maps, but we're also, by the strategy that we take, we're kind of forced into it anyway. Just wanted to point that out. Okay, let me now describe this universal construction. It's pretty far reaching and uh, idea. Um, and I'll just sketch it. Uh, yeah, so the main idea and this, she usually quoted this BHMV. So the main idea is invariance of closed n dimensional objects can give you TQFT for n minus one dimensional object. And this is kind of intentionally vague and also the word object is intentionally vague because it's quite a general procedure. So in our SL2 setting, and I'll describe the SL3 story in the next, in the second half of the talk. So in the SL2 annular setting, here are the closed objects that we're interested in. Here's the definition. You know, an anchored surface is a closed surface transverse to this anchor line L. It can intersect it, but it can intersect it, but it has to do so transversely. And it has other pieces of data associated with it. These intersection points uh, of S with the line, which I'll call anchor points, following data, it's a labeling of, of one or two, either one or two for every single part of S. And moreover, components of S may carry some number of dots. This is uh, something familiar in, uh, in link homology. So that's an anchored surface. And we'll also consider anchored cobordisms. As before, they live in R2 cross the interval. Their boundary is disjoint from the line but otherwise the interior of the surfaces could intersect the line. It has to do so transversely. And it also carries labels in one or two. And you can stack, you can compose these cobordisms in the natural way. So those are 
kind of n-dimensional objects. Here's some examples. Uh, on the left, here's just the two sphere. It intersects this line twice and it carries some labels on these intersection points with an asterisk. Uh, and the labels are I and J, whatever they are, one or two, and has some number of dots. And then here is an anchored cabordism. It goes from one non-contractible circle on the bottom to one non-contractible circle on the top. And it, again, it has some maybe some genus, some intersection points, and some dots. So those are the kinds of gadgets we're interested in. Now I'll describe the universal construction idea in our setting, and it's quite general. It's appeared often in the in link homology at this point. So suppose we have the following, we have some evaluation bracket S or like some invariant, which I'll denote bracket S for closed anchored surfaces and it's valued in some commutative ring R. So fix C, a collection of simple closed curves in the punctured plane. And we're going to take this giant module, FR of C, and it's the free R module. Its basis consists of all anchored cabordisms, S, they live in this lower three space. And their boundary is exactly this uh, collection of curves C. So you take all of the cabordisms, which all anchored cabordisms, which who which bound C. So this is a huge uh, module. This is not what we assign to C. We're going to take this bilinear form on this giant free module in the following way. Take two of these basis elements bounding C, S1 and S2, and keep S2. Take S1 and flip it upside down so you can reflect it. And now stack it on top of S2 by gluing along their common boundary, which is precisely equal to C. Now you have a closed anchored surface and you can take its evaluation or compute the invariant, the bracket like, of that closed surface to get something in R. And we're gonna take the kernel of this bilinear form and define the state space to be this free module quotiented by the kernel. So it's, as you can probably see, it's a, quite a general procedure. You start with this invariant, this evaluation, and then you build this state with uh, the state space uh, using this using this, met this method. So that's what we assign to C. And here's an example. So here C is just a single non-contractible circle uh, in the punctured plane on the top of these here. So there are two cabordisms, S1 and S2. They're just topologically disks that bound C. They intersect this line once. Like I said, these intersection points have to have some labels. And here it's labeled one, here it's labeled two. And then there's also some number of dots. And if you want to compute the bilinear form on say SI and SJ, you fix SJ, which is on the bottom here. You take SI and you flip it upside down. So it's on the top, like the top half. And then you glue along the common boundary. So here you're just going to get a two sphere. Uh, that looks like this, and the number of dots just add. And then you compute the evaluation, whatever the evaluation is. And the kind of really nice benefit of this construction is if you have an anchored cabordism between these collections of circles, you immediately get a map on state spaces defined in, uh, in like the clear way. You just take a basis element for say C0 and you stack S on top of it. And now you're going to get a basis element for C1 and it factors through the kernel um, is straightforward to see. So it comes down to defining a, a nice evaluation, um, but you get functoriality for free. So now let me explain in our setup what the evaluation is. I'll do this kind of quickly. Uh, so we're going to have some formula that evaluates or gives an invariant of uh, anchored surfaces. So let S be an anchored surface. I'll let comp of S denote the set of components. And a coloring of S is a function from the set, uh, from, uh, the set of components to just one or two. So it's a coloring C 
uh, just label or colors each component by a set by a one or two. So if you have n components, there are two to the n colorings. And I'll let a d m of s denote the set of colorings. And the reason for this notation is in the higher rank, like say in the SL3 setting, there's a notion of coloring and admissible coloring. For surfaces in SL2, every, all colorings are admissible, but the notation is we will still keep it. So this is just the set of colorings. And we're going to consider this ring, our alpha polynomials in two variables, alpha one and alpha two. This is the ground ring for our evaluation. And here's how the evaluation is going to be defined. And again, this is in the following ideas of Robert and Wagner. So for, for a coloring, we're going to define an evaluation bracket S comma C, which depends on C. This doesn't live in our alpha necessarily. It might have denominators of the form alpha one minus alpha two, to some exponent. And once we have uh, this evaluation for the coloring C, we're going to set the, like, the total evaluation of S to just be the sum over all the color, all the, these evaluations over the set of colorings. So it's a state sum kind of gadget. Okay, so now I just have to say, what is our evaluation for a, for a given coloring? That's what I'll um, write. And so even though S uh, bracket S comma C uh, might have these denominators, uh, the total evaluation doesn't. So now let me describe how to evaluate the, the invariant given um, coloring. So fix some closed anchored surface S and a coloring C. And for I, either one or two, we'll let DI of C denote the number of dots on components colored I. So there's some components which are colored one. And so D sub one of C is just the total number of dots on those components and the same for two. And I'll let S sub two of C denote the union of all the two colored components. So some of the components may be colored two according to C and we'll just let S sub two Note all of those. Yeah. And for one of these intersection points, P, let L of P denote the label. And remember, this comes with S, uh, and so it's independent of C. This is part of the data of the A. On the other hand, let C of P denote the color of the, <clears throat> of the component which contains this intersection point. And this depends on C. So there's a label which is fixed. And then there's the color of the point, which depends on the coloring of the surface. And here's the formula. It's probably a lot to take in at once. So I'll go through it uh, carefully. So the first thing is the sign, negative one, and it's raised to one half the Euler characteristic of S2. These are closed surfaces in R3, so they have even Euler characteristics, so we can divide by two. So there's this sign. And moving along, we have alpha one to the D1, alpha two to the D2. And these these brackets are dots. And in this denominator, we have alpha one minus alpha two raised to the exponent, uh, or their one half or their characteristic of S. So this is where the denominators come in. And finally, we have this product, it's over all the anchor points, P. And here we have alpha whose index is the color of P minus alpha index is the label of P. And then there's this square root that we take, which is done more or less the natural way, um, but I won't really get into it. So that's the evaluation formula. I will also say that this first chunk uh, without the uh, contribution from anchor points has already appeared in the literature. And so here we have this new contribution from intersection points. Here's the formula again, and I just wanted to show some examples. So here we have a two sphere, which intersects the line twice, and it has some labels, say, let's say they're oppositely labeled, like in this first example, the top one's labeled one, bottom one's labeled two. This is going to evaluate to zero because both of the colorings evaluate to zero. So let's say the sphere is colored by one. There's, a, there's two colorings, either the whole thing is colored one or it's all colored two. So let's say it's colored one. Well, then when you, under the square root, you're going to see a term from this top, that, from this top anchor point 
it looks like alpha one because that's the color minus alpha one because that's the label. So it's gonna be zero. Same for the other coloring. And then you have these other two spheres which uh, have these evaluations. And we'll note that the evaluation is not a symmetric polynomial, which I will say more about on the next slide. So this evaluation is not in general symmetric in uh, alpha one, alpha two. If the surface is disjoint from L, then this evaluation is the usual one from, in, from the equivariant story. And in this case, it is a symmetric polynomial. So it lives in the subring of symmetric polynomials, which is itself a polynomial ring in these two variables, uh, these elementary symmetric functions. And the Frobenius algebra that you assign that is associated with a contractible circle is this familiar uh, ring from one of the for earlier slides. Um, and this defining quadratic relation actually splits over this, uh, over this bigger ring, not just the symmetric functions. And so this can instead just be defined over the subring of symmetric polynomials, but here we have these roots of the polynomial of this defining relation as well. And uh, it gives kind of more flexibility and uh, especially in these evident in this annular setting where you need this bigger, um, this bigger ring. Um, I'll say just a little bit about this. Let me just show this. So the state spaces are bigraded. So there's this usual quantum grading, QDEG, which is, which I mean, corresponds to the usual quantum grading if you're familiar with it. And it's given by this formula minus the Euler characteristic plus twice the number of dots plus the number of anchor points. So this is kind of somewhat standard just without this anchor point contribution. On the other hand, there's a second grading, ADEG, and it comes from intersections with this line in the following way. So we label the anchor points. So we orient the line in some way, and this gives you an ordering on the intersection points, the anchor points, and you just order them one through M. And you set the annular degree to be the sum over the, these points. So each point contributes either plus or minus one, and that sign depends on the label of the point as well as its position. So there's this alternating nature to the contribution. Uh, it turns out this is the right thing in our setting. And both of these gradings extend to anchored cobordisms and to state spaces. So you get two gradings, as you would expect uh, from the perspective of annular homology. So we have. Um, we can identify the state spaces. Uh, that's the next thing you'd want to do. We have some module assigned to state spaces given by the free module mod some kernel. So can we identify it? And we can, we have this usual, we have neck cutting relations for anchored surfaces. So here we have the first one, which is maybe more familiar to some people, uh, maybe without this E1 term, but in the equivariant story, there's this is the neck cutting. And we also have this neck cutting for a tube that goes around the line. Uh, and this is the formula that we verify, this kind of anchored neck cutting. And this allows us to identify the state spaces as well, this as well as just computing the bilinear, okay, the pairing on some a simple uh, surfaces. And what we prove is if C consists of N contractible circles and M non-contractible circles, its state space is a free module of this graded rank. And Q controls the quantum grading, A controls the annular grading. And this is more or less just from neck cutting and uh, computing the invariant on, a, on some, uh, some of the surfaces. And so now we have this construction, this state space construction or universal construction and applying it to the cube of resolutions gives you annular link homology. And it turns out, this is something else that we prove, is the annular link homology defined via this uh, universal construction using our evaluation is isomorphic to the one in this earlier paper, which uses the filtration argument. So it's really the same chain complex even. And this is for the SL2 side of things. In the next, uh, next half of the talk, I'll describe the SL3 side.